I'll be speaking today about drug repurposing um, in COVID-19 and really trying to apply lessons um, from the work that we've done um, in the fight against Castleman disease and to apply to COVID-19. So just a, a brief background on, on who I am. Um, I, I began my training here at Penn as a medical student um, and then became very ill with a cytokine storm, um, not very dissimilar from what we see in COVID-19. Um, very, very sick at Penn and had a number of relapses of what's called idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease, an IL-6 driven cytokine storm disorder before eventually identifying a drug um, that we could repurpose, a drug that's 30 years old that was developed for kidney transplantation um, that we could repurpose uh, to treat Castleman disease. Um, and this has been um, highly effective for me and for a portion of other Castleman disease patients. So about five years ago, I joined the faculty here at Penn where we've been focused on Castleman disease and related cytokine storm disorders and more recently started a center focused on cytokine storm treatment and laboratory, and we call it the Castle. So the patient photographed on the left is a Castleman's patient in the HUP ICU. On the right is a COVID-19 patient. And you've already heard um, thus far about some of the immunophenotypic changes that, we, that, that are observed in, in COVID-19, some of the profound T-cell activation, uh, increased levels of plasma blast. There are also a number of cytokines like interleukin-6, um, that are significantly associated with outcomes in COVID-19 and a number of other cytokines that we find elevated in COVID-19, which we also find in Castleman disease. Um, beyond just the fact that the diseases look similar immunophenotypically and also clinically, um, early on in the COVID-19 pandemic, um, there were efforts to begin using drugs developed for Castleman disease for COVID-19. Um, I'll share a quick anecdote about a drug called tocilizumab uh, Tocilizumab blocks interleukin-6 receptor. It was developed by Kazu Yoshizaki, who's photographed here. Um, Kazu developed the drug, and um, I had heard that Kazu also tested it on himself back in the early 90s to prove that it was safe. And when I asked him, he said, uh, no, 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 I didn't give it to myself. The nurse, she gave it to me. So this incredible physician scientist developed the monoclonal antibody against IL-6 receptor, tested it on himself to prove that it was safe. It went on to get approval in Japan for Castleman disease, um, and then eventually uh, came to the United States and got approval for rheumatoid arthritis. And many of my Penn colleagues will certainly be familiar with the use of tocilizumab to uh, treat the first pediatric patient with CART therapy, Emily Whitehead, who benefited from tocilizumab, survived. Um, and, and thankfully, this drug tocilizumab has helped many other patients with RA and also CART therapy. Um, interestingly, early on in the COVID-19 epidemic, um, tocilizumab was, um, was tried uh, anecdotally. It was also reported um, in China. And then about a month ago, a press release came out from a non-randomized but controlled trial of tocilizumab um, where they report that there was significant improvement in moderate and severe COVID-19 patients. Unfortunately, the paper itself has still not come out. Um, so the jury's out on the effects of IL-6 receptor blockade um, in COVID. Um, but when we think about um, drug repurposing in COVID, I just wanted to highlight the framework that we use um, when, when we in, in our center think about drug repurposing. There are a number of ways to identify um, potential candidates, and we always look uh, to ways to validate that we think it truly is a drug candidate. Um, and of course, uh, the nice thing about already FDA approved drugs um, when you're repurposing is that many times those drugs have already actually been given to people who have the condition that you're interested in. So, for example, statins have, are given to many people who already have uh, COVID-19 or who have COVID-19 exposure. And so you can look to see if there are any associations between exposure to drug and outcomes. Um, and then, of course, as we've seen um, prolifically since COVID-19 erupted, uh, there's a tremendous amount of off-label drug use. Um, and, and of course, there are interventional studies which lead to either FDA approval and or adoption. Um, but we decided we wanted to track all of the off-label and experimental use um, of drugs in, in COVID-19. So I launched a project called the Corona Project back in early March um, with the goal of tracking all drugs given um, in all published cases of COVID-19. Um, we, we established first a team of about 30 volunteers. Now it's up to over 60. Um, that have reviewed through over 13,000 papers and extracted data on 38,000 patients with COVID-19. Amazingly, over 200 drugs have been given um, to these 13 or to these 38,000 patients um, with COVID-19. So doctors are throwing lots of drugs at patients. 
Um, we've heard about a few of them in the press, a few that I'll highlight, the top three, lopinavir, ritonavir, um, corticosteroids, and interferon alpha beta are the top three drugs, but as I mentioned, over, over 20,000, or sorry, over 200 um, drugs have been given to this really large cohort. Um, we're maintaining this in an open source database so anyone and everyone can access it. Um, and from the very beginning, the FDA has been asking for extracts of the database, so we're sending data directly to the FDA um, and also working with the CureID app and with um, academic institutions. So we published the first paper on this data um, about a month or so ago on the first 9,000 patients, and not surprisingly, antivirals um, were the most frequently used um, drugs um, in this first uh, cohort of 9,000 COVID-19 patients. You'll notice our cohort is, is highly biased towards hospitalized patients. Nearly all patients were hospitalized. Uh, almost a quarter of them were on ventilators. Um, and, and then out of that group, there were 20% where we actually did not know um, the status of whether they were on a ventilator um, or not. And at the bottom of the screen, you can see some of the drugs, um, uh, the top 15 drugs, and you can immediately appreciate I mentioned that hundreds of drugs have already been given. At this stage, 115 drugs have been given to the first 9,000 patients. And you can immediately appreciate that after you get um, past drug number 15, that you're down to about 1% of patients or, or less receiving that drug. So there's a really long tail of drugs given in, in, in very small numbers to COVID-19 patients. We were very ambitious early on in thinking that, well, if most of the patients are hospitalized and a large portion of them are on ventilators, maybe we can look at the time uh, to uh, in complete uh, resolution of symptoms or the time to discharge to get a sense for whether some drugs were working better than others. Um, we realized as we got into the data that that was um, a bit unrealistic because this disease is so heterogeneous. The natural history is that most patients improve and e even most hospitalized patients improve. So as a result, it's very challenging to pull um, any sort of conclusions um, from these sort of observational studies without randomized controlled trials. Um, I do think it's important to note that it, it's quite clear that, um, and this is from COVID-19 and from many other viral infections, that it's really all about having that appropriate Im immune response. And so just to, to visualize it um, here very simply, um, if you think about this as a, a balance beam, there's the a too weak of an immune response and too strong of an immune response. Some drugs, um, like interferon, um, can actually move you towards a stronger, uh, maybe more appropriate immune response. But if you're already having a hyperimmune response, then maybe that'll be bad. And, and conversely, a drug like dexamethasone could be helpful if you're having too strong of an immune response, but it actually could be harmful um, if you're having too weak of an immune response. Recently, there's been some debate, um, I think appropriately, around if cytokine storm is the right term to use. For these patients, um, uh, these authors looked at IL-6 levels in particular and found that IL-6 levels really are not as even close to as high as they are in things like CART therapy or in Castleman disease. Um, and so the question is, are the cytokines high enough? And I think that um, the debate shouldn't really be on level of cytokine, but I really think that the question of a cytokine storm requires elevated cytokines and it requires organ dysfunction due to those cytokines. Now, of course, it's challenging to say, well, how do you know if it's due to the excess cytokines or if it's due to the pathogen? And, and I think the best way to ask that question is through interventional trials of drugs. If you block IL-6 and patients get better, then you can make an assumption that that excess IL-6 was, was beyond what was necessary. Or if you suppress the immune system with uh, dexamethasone and there's improvement, again, you can get that sense. So when I think about treatment and drug repurposing in COVID-19, um, and, and we published this about a month or so ago, we try to break it into to various steps along the way. Of course, there's um, the virus getting into the body, replication, transmission within the body, but then there's also this immune response, and whether it's too weak um, or too strong. And so we tried to categorize uh, where many of the drugs um, that were given potentially fall into this. And of course, this is based on a lot of in vitro data um, that has not been proven out in vivo. Um, but these are the various drugs, how we think they may be having an effect. Um, and I did want to highlight that our lab's been um, performing secondary analyses of single cell RNA sequencing data um, of COVID-19 uh, cases, particularly by Ruth Ann Langen in my lab. And um, we've been able to find a similar signature in the COVID-19 cases to what we found and published previously over the last year of this type 1 JAK-STAT mTOR um, signature that we find in idiopathic MCD potentially, uh, meaning that a JAK-1-2 inhibitor or an mTOR inhibitor could be useful. Ruthann's also um, looking at uh, the single cell RNA sequencing data in light of all the drugs that are in our corona database, so what's actually being used 
and what pathways are enriched um, on the single cell level. I'm going to close in these final couple of minutes um, by highlighting um, two drugs in particular that um, I think are, are really interesting. Um, and, and of course, I think you guys are all aware of the dexamethasone recovery study. Um, but I did want to highlight that um, this is a way to get to this question of is it a cytokine storm? Is it excess inflammation? And I think that um, what, what we all were so pleased to see was that one third of patients uh, or there was a one-third uh, improvement in mortality among patients that were the most sick, that were on ventilators. Um, and so you can think about that if this is this inflammatory spectrum, that those were the farthest to the right. Um, and there was also an improvement, but not as great of an improvement um, in mortality among patients who were on oxygen alone, moving them closer to the middle. And then interestingly, for patients who were not yet receiving oxygen when they began dexamethasone, um, there was a trend towards potentially a worse outcome in those patients. But of course, it was, it was not statistically significant. But I think that this does, um, uh, it provides interventional clinical trial data to get us towards this question of, um, is there excess inflammation? Is this a cytokine storm? And of note, 20% of patients in our database um, have actually been treated with uh, corticosteroids before this, this data ever came out, suggesting that likely tens of thousands of patients have potentially had their lives saved by corticosteroids. Um, and, and of course, uh, you know, it was before the trial came out. Um, quickly on hydroxychloroquine, just because I don't think you can talk about repurposing without mentioning it. Um, a randomized control trial by the same people who did the DEX study found no difference um, between patients on hydroxychloroquine versus best care. Um, there was recently a, a big headline from Henry Ford saying that there was a uh, death rate was cut in half in these patients, which I think we were all thrilled to hear because we all want death rates to be cut in half. And it was great to see this, this big difference between 26% and 13% between patients treated with hydroxychloroquine versus not. But if you dig deeper into the data, um, you appreciate that actually the group that didn't get any drug was significantly older than patients who did get hydroxychloroquine, and it strongly associated with, with outcomes. So the headline could have been older patients uh, with COVID-19 die at, at, at a higher rate uh, than younger patients with COVID-19. And, and there was also a huge difference in steroid use between the two. So the last couple of points around next steps um, are that we need to continue to track repurposing in, in, in COVID-19, um, investigate whether this is a cytokine storm that's pathogenic, continue to search for actionable drug targets, um, and also advocate for drug repurposing beyond COVID-19. Of course, I've had a, a huge uh, number of people that have been a part of this that I want to thank. Thank you guys so much.